Presents where I have movie nights and then we talk about them. Uh, so last time was supposed to be during Band Films Week, got delayed, but I, I still showed some Band Films. It was a Video Nasties triple feature, and we are going to talk about it right now. So the first movie we watched was A Bay of Blood, um, one of my favorite Video Nasties. There's like Four or five top-tier video nasties. Uh, this is one of them. Evil Dead is one of them. And then the other... Two. It's, it's four. The other two are very hard to find in America. Which is why I did not recommend them. <laughs> I think both Blu-rays I have for them are imports. I might be wrong, but... Uh, the other two are Possession and Flesh for Frankenstein. Excellent movies. Highly recommend both those films. But they are very hard to come by in the U.S. So, and I already have plans for showing Evil Dead. So that's why we got to watch Bay of Blood. Because it's a top-tier video nasty that is not that hard to find in America. Although it was the first time I watched it. The first time I watched it, I watched it... Not exactly legally, but Kino, Kino Classics released this Blu-ray of it. I think this Blu-ray was already out, actually, as part of the, uh, the Mario Bava collection. And they only recently started selling it individually because the, like, the box set it was a part of is out of print. So now you can just get the Blu-ray. It's also on, like, Fandor, I think. It's, it's on a streaming service. I don't know which one. I don't have it. So, uh, A Bay of Blood is a film by Mario Bava, the grandfather of Italian horror. Um, if you want to know anything about Italian horror, you gotta know Mario Bava, you gotta know Dario Argento, and you gotta know the third guy whose name I completely forget. Lucio Fulci, that's the third one. I, I thought of it before I had to look it up. Good for me. Yeah, th those are the three big names you need to know. Um, Mario Ba... Because Italian horror kind of... stopped existing for a while because Italy had very strict censorship laws. And then in the 60s, they started relaxing those censorship laws. And Mario Bava made uh, Black Sunday. Which is a great movie. We will almost definitely be watching Black Sunday eventually. Black Sunday, which is the first, like, return of Italian horror. And from there, Italy started making some of the most violent, fucked up horror movies of the 70s and 80s. Um, we just looked at one right at the end of uh, Band Films Week, Cannibal Holocaust. That's an Italian film. Also, uh, Caligula was an Italian film. <laughs> so, they, they went from, like, heavy censorship to, like, absolutely no censorship. Go ahead, make the most fucked up movies you want. So, A Bay of Blood, early example of Giallo films, although... <sighs> Giallo films are usually, like, a murder mystery, where there's, like, one or maybe two killers going around and they're, like, teamed up. This is just everybody killing everyone. Um, and that's not even, like, a spoiler. The opening scene is someone killing... Like, this guy kills a woman, and then he also gets killed by someone else. So... I am now going to... It's kind of hard to follow the first time you see it, so I'm gonna try to explain the plot of A Bay of Blood. And... So spoilers, spoilers if you haven't seen it. I do highly recommend it. It's a great movie. So minor spoilers moving forward. So there's this old lady who owns this Bay Area property, 
and these two real estate agents are trying to buy it from her, but she won't sell. So they convince her husband to kill her and then sign with them. But right after her husband kills her, he gets murdered by her son. And then the son goes around, kills a few more people, but then uh, her daughter shows up with her daughter's husband, and they also kill a guy, and then... Uh, and then they kill... No, the, the son kills the two real estate agents, and then they kill the son, and they're the last two standing, so they're like, haha, we get the bay, and then someone else kills them. I won't spoil who, because it's the greatest ending of any movie ever, save, like, maybe Dirty Mary Crazy Larry, another film I hope to show. Dirty Mary Crazy Larry, best ending ever. Bay of Blood, second best ending ever. So, it's a, it's a long, complicated string of backstabs and, and team-ups and, and revenge killings. So it's not just, like, a straightforward murder mystery at all. There's even, like, a moment in the film where it sort of becomes those, like, teens go out to a cabin in the woods and get killed by a, a crazy person movies for, like, 20 minutes, and then all four of them are dead. All four of them are dead before the halfway point of the movie. So it's like, all right, that's just in there for fun. Um, yeah, a detractor would call it pointless, but I, I say it's misdirection. Great movie, brilliant movie, and the, the kills are so fun, the story's interesting, I, the ending is hilarious. Um, there, there is, there is, like, an element of comedy to this. It's not a straight-up horror comedy, but there are, there is an element of horror, of comedy to it. And I think a lot of the best horror films have an element of comedy to them. You know, Bride of Frankenstein, uh, Bong Joon-ho's The Host, Dawn of the Dead, all very funny movies, despite not really being horror comedies. I really wish I had seen A Bay of Blood before I reviewed the, uh, the Friday the 13th series, because the creators of the first Friday the 13th have been open about, like, oh yeah, we were very strongly inspired by A Bay of Blood, and I, I see the inspiration. But Friday the 13th Part 2 straight up steals from A Bay of Blood. There is a murder in, in A Bay of Blood that is stolen shot for shot in Friday the 13th Part 2. And I included it in my montage of like, oh, the best kills from Friday the 13th, Halloween, and Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, it's uh, a guy in, in this movie, the killer in Friday the 13th Part 2, it's Jason. Uh, he... he picks up, like, this mask a Joker had been using. There's, like, the jokey character, and he was wearing a mask and holding a spear early in the film. And then later, the killer comes in, and it's a POV shot, and he picks up the mask and puts it on, and then he picks up the spear, walks upstairs to where a couple is having sex, takes the spear and stabs them both through while they're having sex. Double kill. Um, that's from this movie, and it is shot for shot stolen. In Friday the 13th Part 2. Like, I can't believe they got away with that. I can't believe there was no legal action taken. It's like, it, it even looks like the same house. It's like, it's like they purposefully designed the set in Friday the 13th Part 2 to look like the house from A Bay of Blood. A lot of the sets in Friday the 13th Part 2 look like sets from Bay of Blood. But I mean, like, that's fair enough. Like, it's, it's a franchise inspired by this. But, like, to just steal a scene, it's like, come on, dude. The, the copy I have is A Bay of Blood. That is the most common title, I believe. I, I haven't seen it listed too many times under alternate titles, but it is also known as Twitch of the Death Nerve. It is also known as Carnage, which is a really lame title. Like, Carnage is such a nothing title. 
Whereas Twitch of the Death Nerve, that's like one of the classic weird giallo titles, like uh, Don't Torture a Duckling, or Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key. Twitch of the Death Nerve fits right in with that. A Bay of Blood, uh, probably the most appropriate title. Uh, the, the one... I, I see why it's the one that's stuck. It's the most appropriate. The Italian title is like Entomology of Crime or something. Because um, there's an entomologist in the film. Uh, it's gone under a couple of other titles. Uh, one of them was Last House on the Left Part 2. Which is weird. It's not the only film to claim to be Last House on the Left Part 2, even. So, one of the alternate titles makes this a fake sequel, but it is a fake sequel that is vastly superior to the film it is pretending to be. It's nothing like Last House on the Left. I don't know where that title came from. You know, like, Late Night Trains, House on the Edge of the Park, even I Spit on Your Grave, I'm like... Yeah, if you call those Last House on the Left Part 2, fine. That makes sense. They, they're all Last House on the Left ripoffs. This is nothing like Last House on the Left. It's way better. It's way better than Last House on the Left. One of the alternate titles is Snuff Is My Game. So uh, it ties into the film Snuff that I just reviewed. Um... And it actually helped the film Snuff a little, because this got an R rating in America, so under the titles, like, the film Snuff Is My Game had an R rating, and so advertisements were made for the film Snuff under the title Snuff Is My Game, and they're like, yeah, we're a rated R movie. They weren't. Uh, Snuff is unrated. It might, it might have received an X rating, I don't remember. But it's, it's like unrated. So, it did, did not get an R rating, I'll tell you that much. So it, they lied about having an R rating by claiming to be this movie. Which is kind of funny. That's Bay of Blood. Excellent movie. Uh, one of my favorite Giallo films. In fact... Ooh... Deep Red. Deep Red is good. But I think I'm gonna say it's my favorite. I think I'm gonna say it's my favorite Giallo. I might change my mind later, but I think it's my favorite Giallo. Up next we watched Frozen Screams, and... Uh, I was a little doubtful last time, because I have seen so many video nasties, I'm like, I've seen all the interesting ones. Everything that's left is just really boring, probably. And... But I, I had some hope for Frozen Screams, partially for being in for being released by Vinegar Syndrome, and partially for being on like Bleeding Skulls top fifty trash horror movies of the eighties. And to be fair, it was weird as fuck, so I am not disappointed in this pick. That does not mean I think it was a great movie. It was not a very good movie, actually, but it was weird, and it was interesting, so it has that going for it. Frozen Scream is about this... This scientist... It's, it's one of those movies where, like, the line between science and, like, weird occult magic is really blurred. A lot like, uh... Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. This also takes place at Halloween. It's like the low-rent version of Season of the Witch. So there's like these two scientists, but they're also kind of part of a cult. And they're doing these experiments into eternal life. And they've found like a way to like bring people to the brink of death. And then, but before they die, like bring them back as zombie servants. But sometimes the experiment goes wrong and they become psychopathic killers. And so there's a couple of them roaming around just, like, killing people. Weird as fuck. Weird, weird movie. But 
I like weird movies. I, I don't know that I would encourage people to stay away from this one. This one might be worth seeking out. I think, I think it's on YouTube. Uh, but, like, it's not bad. It's, it's <laughs> interesting. I should, I should mention, I, I kind of brought it up last time. Uh, and I, I mentioned this was on Bleeding Skulls, like, the trash horror movies of the 80s. This film was made in 1975. It has a copyright date of 1975, but it was never released. It just sort of bounced around for a while, and then eventually it was released onto VHS. I believe it was released onto a VHS double feature with the other film in this double feature, The Executioner Part 2. Um, no spoilers, but I might look at The Executioner Part 2 for Fake Sequel Month. Um, because there's no Executioner Part 1. And that's, there's Executioner Part 2 is a sequel to nothing. And it got paired up with Frozen Screams back in the day. So, uh, it's kind of a 70s movie, but it's kind of an 80s movie. Because it was made in the 70s, but released in the 80s. And not even, like, made in 1979 and then released in 1980. Like, made mid-70s, not released until, like, 81. <laughs> uh, there's a shot in the movie of, uh, like, a topless woman. And she has, like, her arms crossed. Like, you think to cover up her tits, but she also, like, has her hand underneath one of her nipples. So you can still see it. She's not covering anything. But it looks like she's making the stance to cover her tits. This is a weird thing that stuck out to me. It <laughs> stuck out. <laughs> no pun intended. There's this weird moment, like, halfway through the film. Because, uh, like, the, the main character's husband is the one who's, like, most recently been abducted by this science cult. And so her husband is acting like a psychopathic maniac. And she's, like, in the backyard at this Halloween party. And these, like, kids walk up. To, she's, she's even, like, walked away from the main group of people. She's around by, like, the side of the house. And these kids walk up to her and are like, Trick or treat! It's like, what are you kids doing here? Why would you go to the side of the house and not the front door? They're like, oh, the, the man inside wouldn't open the door. It's like, so move to the next house. Don't go into someone's yard just to trick or treat. She didn't have candy on her. Like, if she was holding a bowl of candy, it might have made sense. But she wasn't. The, the, the trick or treaters just walk up to her. I guess for, like, kind of a jump scare, there's kind of a, like, trick or treat. And she's like, oh, oh, it's just kids. Ha 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 ha. I don't know, b bizarre movie, but bizarre is kind of good when it comes to video nasties, because, like, if you can't be good, at least be bizarre, because way too many video nasties are just absolutely boring, have nothing going on. <laughs> um, I have ten. I have ten video nasties left that I have never seen, and... So probably next year for Band Films Week, I could do some sort of, like, Video Nasties ranking video. And this will be probably mid-tier. Probably somewhere in the middle. Like, higher than all the boring films, but not super high, because it's still pretty shoddily made. But it's weird. So I'll give it that much. Finally, we looked at Island of Death. Fuck. Okay, I can show that cover. You gotta make sure with some of these video nasties. You can't show the cover of some of these. <laughs> um, in fact, let me see the alternate cover. There's an alternate cover inside here. 
Yeah, I can't show the alternate cover. <laughs> uh, it's Arrow Video. Arrow Video does artwork for their movies, but they make the covers reversible so you can have the original cover or their, like, drawn cover, which I cannot show you. Island of Death. Who boy. <laughs> This is the type of shit that makes me interested in, like, band movies and, like, the video nasties, because it's so... It's so over the top. It's so offensive in every way a movie possibly can be. But it's also a lot of fun. So I, I, I recommended this movie partially just because I wanted to sort of defend the idea of shock value for shock value's sake. Because I think sometimes that can be kind of negative. Like, uh, I'll criticize a movie for just being unnecessarily like, ooh, it's so shocking, get offended. And I think what separates the more interesting films that are super offensive from the haha, aren't you offended movies is how tongue-in-cheek they are, you know, because this is a very, very tongue-in-cheek movie. It is, they don't play any of it straight. It is absolutely a comedy. Um, and that makes me enjoy it, you know, because, you know, films like I Spit on Your Grave, even Cannibal Holocaust, it's like, ha, huh, aren't you offended? And it's, but it's, it's like so gross. And so unpleasant to watch. And I'm like, I don't want to watch gross and unpleasant. I I just want the, just cut to like the offensive stuff. You know, just be transgressive. Don't be like gross. I suppose there's an audience for that type of thing. But I'd, I'd much rather watch stuff like this. Or like Flesh for Frankenstein, which is hilarious. This Flesh for Frankenstein is straight up a comedy. It is the funniest video nasty. Um, you know, like, John Waters' early work, very tongue-in-cheek stuff, very, you know, haha, look how disgusting and offensive we're being. And even stuff like Snuff, I talked about Snuff last week, it's like, it's not intentionally tongue-in-cheek, but it's so bad and so campy that it's like, this is tolerable. This is, this is a funny offensive film. So, Island of Death is an adaptation of Ada by uh, Vladimir Nabokov. That's not true, just a little literary joke for people who know what Ada is about. It's, it's about a couple on a honeymoon, they go to a Greek island, and they're just... terrible. They're a horribly fucked up couple. They're, it's like, it's like proto-natural born killers, you know? Because, because from the beginning of the movie, they're being tracked by the FBI as suspected serial killers. Uh, and you know it's gonna be fucked up from the moment they make a lewd phone call from a telephone booth, a public telephone booth, to the guy's mother. And that gets even more fucked up when you get to the twist ending, which I've already spoiled if you've read Ada. So, basically, from there, they go on this, like, holy Christian crusade to rid this tiny Greek island of, of depravity and, and, uh, degeneracy. But, but, they also themselves engage in it. It's, it's, like, clearly, like, a critique of, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Hypocritical. Christian ideology, you know, a hypocritical, like, far-right thinking where it's, like, judging everyone else for their sins but refusing to reflect that judgment back to yourself. Um, because, like, this dude gets mad at another guy for fucking his wife. He's like, that's a sin, that's adultery! But he doesn't get mad at his wife. His wife fucks a lot of people in this movie, and he never gets mad at her. He only gets mad at the people she fucks. Um, and 
He fucks a sheep. Right, we're just going to put that one out on the table. He fucks a sheep in this movie. So, they're not right, sexually. Um, but they go around killing all the sexual degenerates on this island. Uh, they, they kill... They kill that guy for sleeping with his wife. Uh, there's a, a newly wedded gay couple. And... It's a film from the 70s. So... One of them, like, cross-dresses. And... They didn't really have the language. Definitely not whoever made this movie didn't really have the language to express whether he was just a gay man or if he was, like, a trans woman or something. Not really important. Two guys get married, and they kill both of them for being gay. And then the woman has sex with another woman. So it's like, again, you see that, like, they're judging the gay people, and then one of them has gay sex. And, and then they kill the woman she has gay sex with. It's just... A constant loop of them having sex with someone, and then killing that person for having sex with them. Horrendously fucked up. Absolutely hilarious. Uh, any discussion of, like, the most shocking or offensive movies that does not include Island of Death is sorely lacking. You know? There's all the lists, and they're always like, oh, Pink Flamingos, oh, Serbian film, oh... Cannibal Holocaust. If you don't include Island of Death, you're a hack. Okay? Do your research. Island of Death. So, last time I asked you, what's your favorite, like, band movie? And, uh, I got a couple interesting answers. So, uh, Henry Koslick over on Patreon mentioned Pink Flamingos. Um, I'm gonna be honest. I just watched Multiple Maniacs, like, a week ago. In fact, uh, one thing Island of Death really reminds me of is uh, John Waters' Multiple Maniacs, so that would make an interesting double feature. <laughs> yeah, uh, I watched Multiple Maniacs last week. I like Multiple Maniacs way better than Pink Flamingos. I think Pink Flamingos is just a little too gross for me. It's like... Like, because I, I, I know I just mentioned I'm okay with it as long as it's tongue-in-cheek, but, like, Pink Flamingos is, like, so fucking over the line that it's like, okay, this has stopped being fun and started being gross. Multiple Maniacs, on the other hand, is a great film. It, it, it knows exactly where the line is and goes right up to it. Hold on. Where is it? There it is. Criterion Collection, baby. I love that there's a Criterion release of this, because this is everything a Criterion movie should not be. It's low budget. It's not artistic at all. It's, it's disgusting. <laughs> the acting is terrible. I love it. It's beautiful. Multiple maniacs. We might watch this. I definitely have a John Waters movie on the docket. Um, coming up in a few episodes. Probably might be next episode. Who knows? But yeah, I have John Waters movies planned. But not Pink Flamingos. Not big on Pink Flamingos. Although, it's better than Female Troubles. I'll give it that much. Um, if you want to get into gross John Waters, Multiple Maniacs is where I recommend you start. Although, Multiple Maniacs I don't think was banned. Pink Flamingos definitely was. Lino tells this interesting story of working at a video shop in Video Nasty's era, Britain. I'm very glad. I, I appreciate Lino's comments. He, he lived through the Video Nasty's era, and I'm, so I'm always interested to hear that stuff from him. Um, <laughs> he does always mention in his comments, he's like, for legal reasons, this is a totally made-up story. And, like, bro, it's not even illegal anymore. I don't think you have to say that. But he talks about uh, working at a video store where uh, the owner had bought a laser disc of Sallow from Japan. And 
secretly selling people copies of Salo. And then, and then, uh, Lino broke the disc. That's, hmm, hmm, that's, I, I would not want to be in that situation. Although, I do have Salo. I'm never going to watch this again. I am never watching this movie again. But I'm keeping the Blu-ray. Because you, you don't own the Criterion version of Salo to watch it. You own the Criterion version of Salo to make people uncomfortable with your life choices. I keep pulling recommendations from that part of the shelf, because it's Rubber, Run Lola Run, The Ruddles, all right scanners, all right here next to each other. So... <laughs> Salo's right there next to all these films I keep recommending, and I keep going... Could recommend Salo. But then I'm like, I don't want to rewatch Salo. I, I have told some of my favorite stories of movies being banned. There's the one about uh, uh, blood-sucking freaks getting banned by the MPA. Not banned. It wasn't banned to, like, watch it, but it was banned to, like... The MPA won't rate it, so... It's effectively banned from a lot of theaters for that reason. Um, and then this week I talked about... Uh, William F. Friedkin um, getting Blood Feast banned, which actually ties into one of the movies we're looking at it, uh, tonight. Uh, as far as my favorite banned movie, I mean, I said last week, like, basically every movie is banned somewhere. <laughs> but uh, I know Life of Brian specifically was banned here in America. And that's probably my favorite band movie, because I love Life of Brian. That's one of my favorite movies. Although, I could make the argument for Night of the Living Dead as well. Because Night of the Living Dead was, I think, banned in Britain. It was part of the Section 3 video nasties, which were, like, kinda banned, but kinda not banned. Anyways, today's question is, uh... Who's your favorite horror director? You know, because I got three films from some of the classics of the genre, you know? Some of the big hitters. Well, one of the big hitters and two fairly underground names that horror fans will recognize. So, you know, last time we watched some, like, crazy weird fucked up movies. So this week, we're not slowing down even a little bit. We're gonna watch some even crazier movies. Probably not as fucked up. I don't know if we can get as fucked up as, as the Island of Death. But uh, certainly we're going to get way weirder. So we're going to start with Wes Craven's People Under the Stairs. Huge fan. Wes Craven, huge name in horror. Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Scream, uh, Hills Have Eyes. People Under the Stairs. Then we're going to watch... Frank Hennenlauter's debut film, Basket Case. Gotta love it. I haven't seen it, so I don't know if you gotta love it or not. I don't know why I said that. <laughs> this is going great. This is good. This is, th 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 kids, remember, film with a script. Use a script, kids. Don't, don't make the same mistakes I did. And then we're gonna end with a movie from this nice big collection, the Herschel Gordon Lewis box set. 14 of Herschel Gordon Lewis's classic films. Make sure it's the right one. That's the right one. We're gonna watch The Wizard of Gore by Herschel Gordon Lewis. Uh, the director of Blood Feast, which I talked about last week. Those are my three recommendations. I'll be back to talk about them in two weeks. Until next time. Have a nice day.